Thank you, Eddie Gonzalez, for being here with us. We really appreciate you. And now, next slide, please. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce everybody here to Eddie Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Audio is good. Everything is cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Correct. If anything happens, uh, you know, sometimes these things do occur. Uh, you know, I get bumped off uh, Zoom or whatever. I uh, will call back in and we will continue right where I left off. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, what I'd like for everybody to do, and I love that we have a small group today, uh, is think of questions as, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to teach you a lot of insider uh, tips and tricks in regards to um, networking and things that have uh, worked for me and I've seen them work for others. I've seen them work for all of the different mentees that I have. Uh, really positive feedback in regards to some of these tips. Some of them they may not work for you. And then the other thing too, and I want you to remember this, is that as you're going through this, maybe meeting people and networking is difficult for you. That's okay. You have to, at some point, jump off the diving board uh, in regards to networking. There's four things that I want you to remember and they're very important. Number one, you're only as strong as your network. Your network is your net worth. And as you get older and as you go through your different career, job changes, internships, that sort of thing, you're gonna realize how powerful a network is. And I'm gonna share that with you as well. The second thing is your character, your brand. You've got NASA, you've got Coca-Cola, you've got IBM, you've got Facebook, Apple. Your last name, that's your brand. And that's who you're gonna be selling for the rest of your life. So when you meet somebody, they may not remember your name, but it is my hope and it should be yours too that they're going to remember how you made them feel so afterwards five minutes five weeks five months something happens or an internship comes up and they're going to say i remember mr herrera and he was so nice and he was respectful let's give him a call and again that's the beauty of networking and being respectful and having a good character the third thing is your skill set you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, that you're ready for it. If you get that phone call today or tomorrow morning, are you ready? And then finally, you're grinding your hustle. The fact that you're here on a Friday night tells me a lot about everybody here. You care and you obviously want to improve your soft skills and hopefully that can turn into an internship or a hire at somewhere. For me, if you get a job at NASA, that's wonderful. If you get an internship at NASA, that's great. But for me, I just want you to be successful. If you get a job in the aerospace industry, whether it's SpaceX, Blue Origin, Lockheed, Boeing, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not on commission. So as we go forward, you can reach out to me. I'm gonna leave you my contact information. And as long as you give me time, and what I mean by that is you've got an interview coming up in two weeks, I can help you prep for that. Uh, you want me to take a look at your resume. I need at least a week's notice. So if you can do that for me, then I can help you. Fair enough? Excellent. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's get started. All right. Okay. So here's my contact information. If you want to do a screenshot. And let's start here in regards to networking. The one thing that you want to do, and Mr. Herrera is already practicing this, is find out the person you're trying to network, where do they live? Where can you reach them most quickly? For me, if you send me an email to my NASA email, I may not see that for a day or two. I don't check my NASA email frequently. The first thing I do is I look for all messages that come from NASA headquarters, all messages that come from my team, and then everything else waits. If you reach me on my Gmail, you'll probably get a response within 24 hours. If you hit me on Instagram or LinkedIn, you're probably gonna get a response from me in a couple of hours because I am very active on social media. So again, as you're networking and you're trying to get a hold of people, do your research and try to find out where they're most active and contact them that way. Ah, uh, yes. So this is Will Smith. 
and he was portraying uh, a gentleman by the name of Christopher Gardner. He was homeless and apparently something really good happened. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so this is what you can expect to hear today. But the beauty of all this, as you're gonna see, is that all the dots connect. When you look at your life, whether it's from kindergarten going forward, or from your first job going forward, or from your first internship going forward, you're gonna see how beautifully the dots line up. And you're gonna be able to see um, the riches of your research and your hard work. And it's amazing when I look at the dots for myself and think, wow, I met that person. And because I had a relationship and that person was in my network, that allowed me to go here, that allowed me to go here, and that allowed me to go there. That might not make sense right now, but by the time we're done, it's gonna all make sense. And you're gonna say, wow, did that really happen? Again, you've got to trust the process. So when I realized that I wanted to work for NASA, I was very young. Father called me into the house and said, this is Apollo 13, this is NASA. Now, these poor astronauts ran into a problem. So not only are they not gonna make it back to the moon, but they may not make it back to earth. So I was mesmerized by that. And this gentleman on the left-hand side, he's the flight director, his name is Gene Kranz. And he said, failure is not an option. So I sat there in front of that TV for hours, watching, listening for updates. Now, again, not Apollo 13, the movie, I'm talking about the real thing. If you haven't seen the movie though, I encourage you to do so or to Google Apollo 13 and read about it, it's fascinating. But in any event, I didn't wanna be an astronaut or an engineer. I wanted to do what Gene Kranz was doing. I wanted to help, I wanted to solve problems and I wanted to help people. So we'll get back to that in a minute as well. So second grade, I'm eight years old. And this was probably one of the worst times in my entire life. It was horrible. So my mom, I thought we were going to the park, play on the swings or what have you. And she handed me this foreign object and I had never seen one before. And I know you're thinking, what? No, but I hadn't. It was a baseball glove. I had never put one on. I'd never thrown a baseball up to that point in my life. I was really nerdy. I liked to read. Uh, I like to, uh, to paint. I was writing poetry at a really young age. I was a very unusual kid, but athletics was not something that I really enjoyed doing. I really didn't. So baseball was not a topic for me. So I get to tryouts. They put a number on me and I'm talking to kids saying, you know, how do you put this glove on? Um, what do you need to do? Where do I throw the ball? What I was doing was networking. Even at a very young age, I understood that if you need something and if you need help, you've got to raise your hand and you've got to ask. That's networking. So they told me the coach is going to hit the ground ball to you, put your glove down, it'll go into your glove and then throw it to first base. Needless to say, when I put my glove down, the ball rolled up the glove and split my lip open. I had uh, seven to 10 stitches afterwards, but my lip was bleeding. I was crying. And the sad thing was everybody was laughing. Parents were laughing. Some of the coaches were laughing. And I'm thinking, this is not funny, right? So they threw a towel at me and told me, just press it to your lip. And I thought, they're going to pull me out. I'm done. No, I had to continue. My mom had dropped me off. So she was nowhere around to save me. Okay. So the next thing is we go to the outfield and we have to catch a fly ball. Now, mind you, after just getting in the, hit in the mouth with a baseball, I wanted no part of a pop fly. So I made a fool out of myself. And of course I didn't catch it. Then they brought us in and said, you're going to hit this baseball. And they handed me a bat. Now I had hit a piñata or two up to that point, but I had never played baseball. So I was holding the bat wrong and nobody helped me or corrected me. I did not hit a ball. In fact, I was really scared that he was gonna hit me with the baseball. Finally, my misery is over, so I thought. They send us all out into the outfield and all of the coaches picked one by one. 
Now they don't do that now, but that's what they did back then. And I was so embarrassed because I was the very last pick. And of course, kids were laughing, making fun of me. And it turned out that I was picked by the coach that won the whole championship the year before. He had a really good team. A lot of players returned. So he absolutely didn't need me. So he's talking to us and he said, okay, we're going to go ahead and meet over there by that tree. So run off the field and I'll meet you there. So as I'm running off the field, one of my teammates tripped me and I fell and a whole bunch of kids fell over me. And of course I got yelled at because they thought I was playing around and I was embarrassed. And mind you, my lip was still bleeding. I just wanted this whole thing to end. That was on a Saturday. On Monday, when I got to school, I got picked on so bad. People were laughing at me, making fun of me, writing uh, you know, horrible notes to me. I used to fake that I was sick. I'd hide in the bathroom. I'd ask the teacher if I could stay in the classroom. And second grade was horrible. And the coach didn't teach me at all. When I'd go to practice, he'd tell me, go sit over there and uh, practice will be over soon. Can you imagine that? But I didn't want to tell my parents what was going on. My dad was starting his own business. He was very busy, worked seven days a week. And I didn't want to let my mom down. So I just said, oh, practice was fine. It was fine. But it wasn't. So now the season ends and I'm glad. But I remember the last game that we played. I mind you up to that point, I didn't get a hit. I didn't do anything and they hardly ever played me. But the coach put me in for the very last inning and I actually hit the ball. I couldn't believe it. I ended up getting thrown out because I wasn't running to first base. I was just amazed that I hit the ball. But I remember afterwards, a lot of kids that had made fun of me were like, hey, that was a really good hit. And I thought, you know, if I practice, maybe I can do this. So a new neighbor moved in across the street. And it was an older gentleman. He had a son that was a couple of years older than me. And they used to play baseball uh, in the afternoons. So I walked over across the street, networking again. And I asked him if he would teach me how to play baseball and if I could join in with them. And every day we practiced every single day. And I became real good. In fact, the next year when we tried out, I was the first pick this time. So... All I needed was practice and a mentor or a coach that would show me the fundamentals. And then of course it was on me. What was the last point that I made to you of the four points? Your grind and your hustle. What are you willing to do today to be successful? So I practiced. Okay, so right around the age of 12, 11, 12 years old, my father said, I'm gonna give you an allowance, but I want you to wash my car and it's got to be immaculate. If there's one thing wrong with it, you got to wash the car all over again, start from scratch. So needless to say, the few times I messed up, I didn't clean under the floor mats or the rear view mirror or something, but I became really good at it. And pretty soon I was washing a couple of my neighbor's cars as well. And I thought maybe I can start a little business, but in order to do that, what do I need to do? I need to network. So I made some flyers. I passed them out of the neighborhood. And pretty soon I had a ton of cars coming. In fact, I hired some of my friends because there was so much business, right? And that taught me a lot too of being a good customer service person, but also my brand. This is who I am. Some of my friends I had to fire because they weren't doing the type of job that I wanted them to do, right? But again, what I was trying to explain to them is this is my business and I want to make sure that it's 100%. And if you're not in it, then you need to go do something else. Now, unfortunately, eight days before my 13th birthday, on Christmas Day, my father died and he was only 43. And it sucked because I was just getting to know him. You know, when he told me about the allowance and his car and all that, his business was actually taking off. So he wasn't working seven days a week anymore. He would take me to Dodger games. He would take me fishing. And he taught me a lot of things. 
but man, I just thought, man, how could you take him? You know, I was just getting ready to know him, you know? So as you can imagine, not having a father and essentially losing my mom too, she went into a severe depression and I hardly saw her in two years, but this kind of brought us back together. So baseball, I was coming home from baseball practice and I was almost home and it's near the school that I go to or went to rather. And I heard a siren, heard another siren. And pretty soon there was about 12 cop cars slamming on their brakes, coming right at me. They pulled out their shotguns, their handguns, the canine, helicopter. And I couldn't figure out what I had done. You know, they told me to freeze, which I did. They told me to drop my bag and I didn't drop it fast enough. Needless to say, they roughed me up pretty good, real good. They, they, they gave it to me. They handcuffed me and they put me in the back of the car. No information. They wouldn't tell me anything. I sat in the back of that car, handcuffed up like this, uncomfortable for about an hour. I'd say about a good hour. Finally, they pulled me out of the car. They uncuffed me. And I asked this one cop that was somewhat being okay with me. And I said, what was that all about? I said, I've got a bloody nose from you guys. What was that all about? He said, oh, there was a burglary in the area. The guy was 6'4", blonde hair in his 40s. I was 14, 5'5", 120 pounds. I, I didn't fit the description at all. I just happened to be in the area and I happened to be a person of color. Well, we put in a complaint with the police department and that was a huge mistake because they put me on their list. So when I was old enough to drive when I was 16, I would get pulled over about six times a week, always going to school, sometimes after school, but they made sure to make me late and they knew it too. I would leave my house at say 7.30, the school's 10 minutes from me and they would pull me over and say, sit here, I'll, I'll be right back. And then at eight o'clock, they'd let me go. Sometimes they'd cuff me and put me in the back of their car. Sometimes they'd put me on the curb. But mind you, teachers are seeing this. Parents are seeing this. And parents are telling their kids, stay away from me. And because I was late, I missed a lot of tests. I missed a lot of assignments. And the teachers had no mercy on me at all. So again, what did I do? I started networking for at least the people that would at least have a conversation with me. And people would say, oh, this is the assignment. This is the work. And it didn't happen all the time, but I hustled to try to find out what was going on, ask questions, uh, trying to get people to tutor me. But because it looked like I was this horrible, horrible person, it was very tough to get help back then. It really, it was just me. So now I'm getting ready to graduate from school and I want to go to a community college and I still want to work for NASA. Now, for me, again, I didn't necessarily want to be an astronaut or anything. I wanted to be like a logistic person, maybe uh, oversee a mission and, and work with all of the uh, facets of that, you know, the budget and, you know, the timelines, the Gantt charts, all of that. But my career counselor said, no, I think you would do well working at a car wash. That should be your career. And I thought that was ironic because that was one of the last things my father had taught me to do. Now, he didn't teach me that for me to work at a car wash the rest of my life. Now, mind you, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a job and it's an important one. However, I thought I could do more. And I barely graduated from school. And when I got to the community college, I was taking classes and I was doing really well. The professors treated me well and I had a really good rapport with them, but I got my girlfriend pregnant. So now I can't go to school and I got to find a full-time job. And I worked at Taco Bell, I worked at Denny's, I worked at all of these horrible jobs. And that same gentleman that taught me how to play baseball, 
he called me over and he said, um, you know, you're looking for a job? And I said, yes, I'm actually looking for a career. And he said, you know what? I can get you an interview at a law firm in Los Angeles. And I said, I don't know anything about law. And he said, you don't need to. All you're going to do is just deliver mail, uh, work in their mail room. I thought I could do that. So now I get this job at one of the largest law firms in Los Angeles. They're still there. It's called O'Malveny and Myers. You can look that up. Now, the really cool thing about that, and I don't mean cool in a cool way, if you will, was the gentleman that is actually, his picture's not here. It'll be in another slide. His name was Warren Christopher. He was secretary of state in the Clinton administration, and he was one of my mentors. And I'd often go to his office and just ask him questions, ask him questions about life, about you know the firm, how it started, um, different things like that. In 19, uh, early 1990s, a gentleman by the name of Rodney King was pulled over and talk about being on the receiving end of police brutality. I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, Rodney King. May he rest in peace. Because of that police brutality, um, Warren Christopher was asked to be the chair commission called the Christopher Commission. Now, I had heard a rumor that that was going to happen, that our law firm was going to be in charge of that. That was huge at the time. It was historic. So before it became a fact and before they announced it, I went to his office and I said, uh, Chris, that's what I called him. I'd like to be your coordinator for this commission and you won't have to worry about anything. I'll handle all the logistics. I'll handle the media. I'll handle travel, transportation, you know, food and beverage, all of that. And he said, okay. Okay, if, if, if this does come to be, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. A week and a half later, he called me and said, you ready to go to work? Absolutely. Now, how did I get that position? I raised my hand. I put myself in a position to get it. Now, mind you, did I know how to do all of that? No. But I asked questions. And as I put my team together, I made sure that I put the right people and I let them be in charge of certain things that they were experts at. And at the end of the commission, oh my goodness, was I praised. And I made sure to say, it wasn't me, it was a team effort. These are the people that should really get that big thank you. And they did, and they did. So again, as I'm saying this networking, it's so important and you never know what it's going to do or how it's gonna launch your career, okay? Okay, second career. Now, because I didn't have the academic behind me, I couldn't just go in and get an internship at NASA. And I had applied and applied and applied. I applied over a dozen times, but because I didn't have the academ uh, academic behind me and I didn't quite have the experience yet, but because of the commission NASA and the people that were interviewing me asked a lot of questions about that. So what did you do for that commission? And I broke it all down and I explained all of the different things. And they said, you're hired. So I got the job at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now again, see how network has been working for me at this point by me raising my hand and asking him if I could do this job actually got me the job at NASA. So while I was at NASA, I was able to get a detail at NASA headquarters, a fellowship and some other things. And I'll explain that in a minute. But I got to meet a lot of interesting people too. In 2005, uh, I was at a conference and I went to this workshop and Dr. Lou Mayo was giving the workshop. He was amazing. So after the event was over, I asked him, hey, could I buy you a cup of coffee? I'd like to talk with you. So we had this amazing conversation. He worked in DC, I worked in um, Pasadena and we became friends. Um, we would see each other at conferences. Whenever he came into town, we would go to dinner. And whenever I was in DC, the same thing. Now, mind you, I didn't speak to him every day, a couple of times a year, but I made sure to stay in contact with him so he wouldn't forget who I was. 
Now let's go back to the crew of Apollo 13. So because I worked for NASA, I was able to go to some of the other NASA centers, actually all of them, and do different things. So uh, probably in about 2007 at um, NASA's Johnson Space Center, I was able to meet Gene Kranz and I was actually able to meet uh, one of the astronauts uh, from Apollo 13. And what an amazing day that was for me. Now, again, because I worked for NASA, I was able to meet them, but I also made sure to put myself in a position to actually go up to them and introduce myself. Um, this is a very interesting story. Um, this person was actually involved in Apollo 13 in a very roundabout way, Judith Love Cohen. So I want you to Google that name and I'll get to that in a minute. I know I keep saying that, but believe me, all these dots are gonna connect, trust me. So I'm at this event called TEDxLA and they wanted me to come and you know bring some of the cool toys from NASA. And I said, I wanna bring some students with me. The tickets were a couple of hundred bucks, really expensive, but I told them, I want you to comp these tickets and I'll bring my toys. So we made the trade and I was able to bring all of these students that you see here. And man, that caused quite a commotion. Everyone was like, wow, who brought the students? So this one gentleman that was running TEDx that asked me to come, he said, hey, this guy wants to meet you. Um, he wants you to go to one of his events that's coming up in about three months. Can I introduce you to him? I said, sure. So that person was Jack Black. Now, a lot of you may or may not know this, but Jack is a huge, huge fan of STEM and helping students. And he does a lot of outreach for that. I didn't know that at the time, but he was very thankful that I brought these students. He really hooked them all up too. And we actually did a couple of uh, events together after this. And he's just a great, great person who wants to see our next generation of leaders succeed. Again, do you see how these dots are starting to connect now? I would have never met Jack if I hadn't gone to TEDx, if I hadn't worked for NASA. So all of these things are starting to connect. Charlie Bolden, so he was the former administrator for NASA. As I'd mentioned to you, I had mentioned that I was able to get a detail at NASA headquarters. So what I wanted to do, and this was on my bucket list, was to actually shadow Charlie Bolden. But unfortunately, he only let one person shadow him a year and that person had already happened. So I did my research and I thought, well, let me see if there's some, some other way I can get his attention. And as it turns out, his daughter was getting ready to graduate from college as she was trying to become an attorney, law firm attorney. So I sent him an email and I said, my name is Edward Gonzalez. And I used to work for O'Malveny and Myers. And he knew who O'Malveny was. I told him about Warren Christopher. And I also told him that one of my best friends was in charge of bringing in the summer interns uh, of attorneys. That immediately got his attention. And he said, can you come up to my office? And I did. And he said, Eddie, what can I do for you? I said, I want to shadow you. And he said, you start tomorrow. So doing your research, finding out is there something that you can do for that other person and then presenting it will create and bring success to you. So again, I was able to not only get that shadow, but it helped me in my career so much. It was an amazing thing. And then I saw him again in 2019 at the Kennedy Space Center, I'm sorry, at the Kennedy Center in DC and he remembered me, which was really cool. So I took a picture with him. Uh, Leland Melvin, former NFL player. And he was uh, doing a detail at the same time I was. Um, you see that stupid look on my face because they were having a surprise party for me when I was leaving and he showed up and I didn't expect him to be there. Now, the cool thing with Leland is I had met um, my girlfriend who's now my wife and she has little kids they're my bonus kids now. And I have a great relationship with them. But at the time I was trying to impress the little one, his name's Liam and his favorite astronaut was Leland Melvin. 
and he used to carry that book around with him all the time, uh, the Leland Melvin book. So for his birthday, I had Leland come to the house and actually spend some time with his birthday. So knock on the door, I go and I said, Liam, it's for you. And when he opened the door, Liam dropped his book and he was like, oh my gosh, it's Leland Melvin. So knowing Leland, developing a really good relationship with him, and he's more than a friend to me, he's like family. He was willing to take some time out of his day to come and make this little boy's day. And it actually made me look good too. Jose Hernandez, another amazing story. And I had met him at a conference and we developed a relationship and we've done some really cool things together. Um, and he's also selling wine now. So if you Google Jose Hernandez and type in wine, you can actually buy a, a bottle of his wine. He's got an amazing story. He applied for the astronaut program over a dozen times, finally got it, went into space. What an amazing guy. Uh, Dwayne Brown, Scott Kelly, Scott Kelly, former Navy captain, former NASA um, astronaut. The story with Dwayne Brown is he was in charge of communication. And when I was at NASA headquarters, I actually went to his office, introduced myself, asked him if I could take him to lunch. Found out he had a daughter that played soccer. Um, and we, we really got along well. We talked about sports, we talked about music. And again, when it comes to networking, you wanna find a bridge with somebody. So maybe somebody collects sneakers. And if you do some research, you can find that out. So my bio is open to the public. And if you are also a sneakerhead, you can say, hey, I just bought this pair of sneakers. What's your favorite pair? And now we're having a conversation. So we're doing the same thing. So I think it was 2017, they were having a Juno press conference at NASA headquarters. And I asked him, can I ask a question from the floor? And he said, yeah, absolutely, I'll call you. So I called my grandkids, I called my kids, I called my mom. I said, I'm gonna be on NASA TV, make sure and turn it on. Well, the press conference ran long and normally they ask about five, six questions. And Dwayne said, I wanna apologize. And he kind of looked at me and he said, I can only take one question from the floor. One of the chief scientists was sitting to my right and he was with his kids and he said, oh, Dwayne and I, we go way back. He'll ask me, he'll let me ask the question. Well, I'm holding the microphone, as you can see. So because of my rapport that I had with Dwayne, and I was respectful, I was kind, um, he picked me. He didn't have to, but I'd like to believe that networking played a big role in that. Dougie Fresh, you probably never heard of him. Uh, he has really cool music from the 80s. He was a uh, former DJ, I used to DJ as well, and I wanted to meet him. Now, trying to meet somebody like Dougie Fresh back in the 80s was virtually impossible. So I wasn't able to meet him until years later, really strange at the White House. Uh, we were doing an event there, he happened to be there and this was in the Obama administration and I wanted to meet him, but his handlers made it clear to everybody that was there Dougie's not taking any pictures. He's not going to talk to anybody. He's going to do his set and he's going to leave. And I looked at Dougie's face and he kind of shook his head like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And I knew he was a good person. So I was able to have a conversation with him. We spoke for about a half hour. We talked about diversity in STEM and his handler that was saying, Dougie's not going to talk to anybody. He was so upset but it was Dougie's decision to not only have a conversation with me, he had a conversation with everybody, it was great. But I put myself out there and I asked him. So again, there's a fine line between being, you know, a stalker status or, you know, just being too cocky. You gotta be respectful and come correct. That's important. I want you to watch this clip. Hopefully you can hear it. So Mr. Herrera, if you could just give me a thumbs up and maybe one other person, uh, if you can hear the volume on this. That's straight. Thank you, sir. Yes. Good. 
thought I uh, wear a shirt today, um, you know, being the last day and all. Well, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. But, uh, wear one tomorrow, though, okay? Because tomorrow's going to be your first day. If you'd like to work here as a broker. Would you like that, Chris? Yes, sir. Good. We couldn't be happier. So, welcome. Was it as easy as it looked? No, sir. No, no sir, it wasn't. Good luck, Chris. Out of 1,400 people, they hired one person, and he got the job. I almost forgot. Oh man, this is my favorite saying. Christopher Gardner right there. That was his cameo in the movie. Now, I read the book. I you know, saw the movie several times. And for me, of all the people that I had met up to that point, I thought, man, if I could meet this guy, all I wanted to do was to get his business card. And if I could do that, I thought, my goodness, I could meet anybody, you know, you know, six degrees of separation, all of that. But I knew it was going to take some work. I was going to have to do my research. I was going to have to do my homework because what could I possibly say to this multi-billionaire who's went literally from rags to riches? You know, what could I possibly say to get his attention? So he was doing a talk in Atlanta and I was in DC flying back to LA. So I asked my travel agent, you know, can you set up a long layover in Atlanta? You know, I'll do a connection there. And he was able to do one for six and a half hours. So I get to Atlanta. I go to the Hilton Hotel airport in Atlanta. And in this huge ballroom, there's probably about 3,000 people in there. You know, he's given his talk. And he's got microphones set up in the uh, aisleways. And I'm thinking, there's just no way. 
this just isn't going to work. You know, um, I need to do something different at this point. So took a chance and I went outside the ballroom and I kind of scoped it down a little bit and I saw some security people at a door that looked like the exit. So I went up to them and I gave them some NASA pins and said, you know, my name is Eddie Gonzalez. I work for NASA. And I said, by chance, did Chris bring his huge entourage or is he by himself today? Oh no, Chris is by himself. I was like, okay, cool. Do you mind if I wait here? No, no, you can wait here. Great. So now Chris comes out and I say, hey, uh, Mr. Gardner, you know, who was that good looking guy that was crossing the crosswalk at the end of the movie? And he started laughing and he said, you know, who are you? And I said, my name is Eddie Gonzalez. I work for NASA and I believe in our next generation of leaders and, and, I, and I help students, I help undergrads. And, you know, if I can tell them about my experiences and hopefully some sort of tip or something will help them out. That's, that's me, that's me all day. And he said, can I get your business card? I said, yeah, if I can get yours. So now I have his card and I am so happy. You have no idea. I felt just like Will Smith did in that one scene. So he leaves, he says, I'm gonna call you. 20 minutes later, he sends me a text. And he said, I've been trying to get a hold of somebody from NASA, man, let's do some work together. And I was, yeah, let's do that, right? So I go to the airport, they bump me up to first class, I fly often, I put on my beats and I tell the flight attendant, I don't want anything. I don't want any water, I don't want any food. I just wanna just, sit here and I briefly told him I just met this guy I've been trying to meet for a long time and I got his card I was showing her the card and I was super excited so I closed my eyes and two minutes later I feel a tap on my shoulder it was Christopher Gardner sitting in 1a I was in 1b now what is the chance of that happening right so we were able to speak and talk and chat for the next four and a half hours and instantly became friends. He became a mentor of mine and he's such an amazing person. And we talk now probably two or three times a week. And right now we're doing, uh, as uh, Mr. Herrera pointed out, uh, talks uh, to high schools and community colleges all over the nation. And some of them we're gonna do live Others we do pre-recorded, and then we come in live to answer Q and A. Now again, who am I? Am I some sort of special magician or something? No. And to be honest with you, I used to be an introvert, believe that or not, but it took a lot of practice for me to come out of my comfort zone. I had to practice being comfortable being uncomfortable, and it took time, you know, if you are an introvert, you can get a wing person to help you, you know, you know, at that conference, at that workshop and have them introduce you and be part of the conversation till you feel comfortable. You know, you can do that, something to think about. This is Warren Christopher, one of my mentors. This is Dr. Joletta Patrick, another one of my mentors who's absolutely amazing. Uh, Dr. Roosevelt Johnson, another mentor. And as you can see, I don't just have one mentor. I have a team of mentors that I go, you know, and talk about different things, whether it's personal relationships or business related. And of course, Christopher Gardner. This is them fooling around. This is me and Chris having uh, dinner at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. And this is just a snapshot of students that I've mentored um, or I've worked with um, and had the pleasure of mentoring. And this picture is really important to me because most of these individuals, if not all of them, are in the aerospace industry now or getting ready to graduate. And now let me wrap up my introduction to Dr. Lou Mayo, as I'd mentioned to you. He did a workshop and I took him to have coffee and I'd see him a couple of times a year. 
in 2016 at a conference, I met this amazing woman and I knew she was the one. I knew it because I had never felt nervous around anybody, really. I was pretty confident in myself. But when I went to talk to her, oh my goodness, I sounded probably stupid. You know, I was fumbling my words and finally I got out you and I are gonna end up together at some point. And she goes, oh my goodness, are you serious? She said, you need to go that way. <laughs> so we were working at the same booth area and it was a pretty large area. So the next day I saw her again and I said, you know, don't forget about me. So we had some, you know, cute bantering back and forth and nothing came of it. The following year we meet again but this time I was bold enough to say, can we go to dinner? And she said, yes. And we developed this long distance relationship. She lived in DC, I lived in California, but I got tired of waking up and her not being there. So I had a decision to make, you know, my kids were grown, they're adults. So it's not like they needed their dad anymore. So I decided to leave NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and see if I could get a job on the, on the East Coast. Now, mind you, I love NASA, but I was willing to leave the agency if I couldn't get a job with them. So I'm at a brunch with about 30, 40 people. And my then girlfriend says, hey, Eddie Gonzalez from JPL is looking for a job on the East Coast. So if anybody knows of anything, and then a voice says, you'd leave JPL? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking. He said, why don't you come see me tomorrow? And I get to Goddard, I walk in the room, and there's Dr. Lou Mayo. He's the one that was interviewing me. And he said, Eddie, we're good. When can you start? And just like that, I got the job. And I've been... Uh, with NASA Goddard ever since. So that was 2018, so several years ago. Now again, you can see how these dots connect. And this is somebody that I met in 2006, but kept in contact with him. So he was well aware of who I am and what I do. And I'm still here. So I must be doing something right. Anyway, that concludes my presentation. I, I hope that I didn't bore anybody. I know it's late, it's Friday, and I hope that you were able to get something out of it. So now I'm gonna open this up for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, that's, it's an incredible story. Definitely appreciate your time here. Definitely appreciate you detailing it all. And I think you had everybody in suspense throughout the whole session. So definitely thank you so much for, for, for everything you shared with us, for all You're the welcome. insight and for sure. the well laid out, laid out story that you created here. So now, as you said, yes, we're in the formal Q and A section. Uh, if anybody has any questions at this point. Yeah, so Mr. Herr, if you could like grab the Q&A too, or if some, you know, if you want to just ask me live, you know, feel free to do that as well. But yeah. if there's any questions in the chat, feel free to ask those as well. So we do have a couple questions from the chat. So let's go, okay, let's go. Uh, Judith asks, how do you draw the line between networking and being too forward when reaching out to someone? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, you want, you know, what, we, what you're trying to accomplish is turning a network into a relationship. So you can't do one before the other. So let's just say that I wanted to, to meet Mr. Herrera. Okay. Uh, I might try looking for him on LinkedIn. Right. But before that, before I reach out to him, I'm going to do my homework and I'm going to find out if maybe he did a TEDx talk or he's written a white paper. Uh, a poster, a technical poster, something like that. So let's just say that he wrote a really cool poster on space weather, excuse me. I would look at that poster and I'd probably come up with a few questions. Then I'd reach out to him and say, saw your poster on space weather. It was really good. 
would you be willing to have a 15 minute coffee zoom with me? I'd love to ask you a few questions. Okay. So how could he say no to that? But he might, if he does, then I'll just go to the next person. So if you are a computer science major, um, you know, aerospace engineer, I would type in top 10 aerospace engineers at NASA and then do what I just suggested. So now that's the question or that's the answer to your question of now I'm keeping it formal for now. So now I've got Mr. Herrera on this call and we hit it off, you feel the chemistry. So now I could say, so you live in San Diego, if you don't mind me asking, do you follow sports? Yes, I do. So you must be a Padres fan, right? Or you like the Chargers. How did you feel when they left San Diego to go to LA? Now we're starting to turn this into something a little more personal. And that's the goal. Because if you can do that, then maybe later on, there might be something I can do for Mr. Herrera, or maybe there's something he can do for me. But always keep in mind, it's what can I do for you? We've got to all help each other. So hopefully that answered your question. Yes, I believe it does. And uh, thank you so much. The next question, I'm going to go over to Lydia Vasquez, who has her hand raised. If you can turn on your microphone, Lydia. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, ma'am. OK, great. Um, thank you so much for sharing your journey. That was very inspirational. I, I really appreciate it. Um, a question I have is, like, uh, as you, um, I don't know if it's, if you already answered it with the previous question, but um, how do you, um, uh, as you mentioned, like, uh, give to them when you're um, networking and you're barely meeting the person introducing yourself? I usually face difficulties because I'm not sure if I should introduce in a second, like what I'm about, what's my passion, what am I studying, all those things, um, mm -hmm. and or how to make it more organic, or if there are any suggestions that you have of how to approach someone that um, you you're really interested in to be a mentor or inspired by their research and like how to go about that. Yeah, that that's a good question. So what I tell students is this, and let me go back to what I told you of. Hey, uh, Mr. Lazaro, can you meet with me for 15 minutes? Okay. So what I'm trying to get from Mr. Lazaro is an internship. Let's say that's my goal. Okay. So we have our Zoom. I have a list of questions uh, for him about his poster and it's flowing really well. What I could then say is, you know, if you'd be willing, I would love to have a second conversation with you so I can tell you a little bit about me and, and what my goals and uh, dreams are. Now, either he's going to say yes, and that's perfect, because I might be able to send in my resume at that point. Or I might be able to say, you know, really looking for an internship. And I think I have what it takes uh, to be a real good intern for you. Okay. But this is the important thing. During that first initial conversation, that first 15 minutes, even though you may be tempted, do not mention your resume. Do not mention your internship. Do not mention any of that unless they ask you. And if they do, my response to, let's just say uh, Mr. Herrera then said, so what are you trying to do? Are you trying to get an internship? And I'd say, well, you know, ultimately that would be my goal. But if you like, I would love to have a second conversation with you to talk about all that because I want to respect your time. I asked you for 15 minutes and I don't want to deviate from that. So you've got to be, you know, respect is key. It really is. Great, great. Thank you, Lydia, for that question. Thank you, Eddie, Thank for that you. response. Um, the, we, uh, we're going to go over to the chat. There was a question that was asked uh, by Melanie. Hello, what gives you the courage to go up to such successful people and connect with them? And how have you been able to maintain strong and long lasting connections with those individuals? Um, good question. So one of the things, and I think this is also important, we all go through imposter syndrome, where we feel like we're not good enough. Um, we're not smart enough. Um, oh, my goodness, what did I get myself into? You know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I want to be in a room where everybody's smarter than me, and I can ask questions too. But the one thing I do recognize, and 
am I confident? Of, co of course I am. And that goes with experience. But everybody gets dressed the same way. Everybody eats the same way. So for me, I'm going to respect your title, but ultimately our title is human being. So for me, I don't get um, starstruck, if you will, when it comes to meeting people. And when I do, again, I'm very respectful and I am appreciative of their time. So it doesn't matter what they do, whether it's an athlete. And I could tell you, honestly, I could show you my quote unquote autograph selfie um, presentation. I have met hundreds and hundreds of celebrities because I put myself out there, but I'm not like a stalker status. I would run into, you know, people at restaurants and whatever. And if they're with their family, I'm not going to bother them. That's the worst place to do that. But maybe I can catch them outside. Um, or if I feel we're at a sporting event and it's appropriate, it's all about respect. And I think that regardless of what you do and who you are, if you're being respectful, you're going to get that respect back. So. Awesome. Thank you. And now we're going to go over to Donovan. Donnie. Can you turn on your microphone and ask your question, please? Thank you. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Hello. Hi, Adi. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much for giving us this presentation. We really Adi, do appreciate up, it. Good to see you. Hey, what's up? <laughs> yeah, great to see you as well. And um, I have a quick question. So I remember you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that we should focus on our grind and our hustle, our character, our skill set. Yep. And also, you're only as strong as your network, right? Yep. And um, I was thinking of what other things we should look for in regards to our own personal development. Yeah, one of the things that uh, the most important thing for me, really, honestly, is character, you know, and respect. So whatever it is that you're doing uh, for someone, um, you want to make sure that you do the best job possible, you know, and then some. So for me, you know, in a given day, if I'm doing an assignment, um, you know, a, a task, a mission or whatever, at the end of my day, uh, I'm gonna, you know, go to my leadership and just say, you know what, I'm gonna get ready to take off. Is there anything else I can do for you before I, before I leave? Um, that's key. Um, in the morning, if I start at nine, I can guarantee you I'll be there at 8.30. You know, I'm always there early. Um, and people notice those things. So it's just those very little things that you can do that's gonna that's gonna make you stand out. It's it's really important. And again, you know, grind and hustle. Let me throw one other thing about how do you meet people. So let's just say that Elon Musk was doing a, you know, a keynote at a ship conference. Okay, and if you can figure out where he's gonna give that talk, it's gonna be in ballroom A. So for me, it's like, okay, where's the closest elevator to that ballroom? Or is it an escalator? You know, um, where is the closest coffee shop to that ballroom? Because there's a good chance he might be on that elevator, might be on that escalator, might be at that coffee shop. Is he going to be with an entourage of people? Do I have enough NASA pins to give one to everybody? You know, but again, it's just putting yourself out there and putting yourself in the right place at the right time. You know, luck is, is a part of it, but doing your research is key. And if you do that, you'll be more successful. Thank you, Donovan. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> thank you, Lassado. <laughs> yeah, always, thank you for the question. Uh, we do have one other question in the chat at this point. Uh, Nino, I hope I said that right. Uh, great story. How many hours do you usually work and how much do you make how much do you make a week? Did you ever plan to actually achieve all these goals or did you ever doubt yourself? Um, that's the question okay. that's submitted. Okay, so how many hours do I work a week? It depends. Um, I would say I work, say on an average week, probably about 55 to 60 hours. But there's sometimes I work 70, 80, 90, it depends. Uh, like, for example, today I started my day at 6 a.m. It's 10 minutes after 11, and I've got a couple of things I need to do after this call. So long day. And I think this week I put in probably 70. 
But then there's weeks that I put in 30, 35, very rare few and in between, but that's the nature of it. So the other thing too is I'm kind of on the clock 24 seven. So I have no problem looking at my emails at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday or on a Sunday. So, you know, if I'm in line somewhere and I'm not networking, uh, I may check an email and respond to it. And again, that's work, you know, it's, it's what I'm doing. Or if I have a, a talk I'm doing the, the following week, I'm prepping for that over the weekend. So again, it just depends. So how much do I make a week? Let's just say that I make well over six figures a year and we'll leave it at that. Um, and I think that's an interesting question um, for a lot of young professionals as well as students because culturally we don't really have that uh, baseline of, oh, how much should I be asking when I jump into my professional level career and how should I negotiate and how should I actually get my worth? If that, I mean, I understand there's, there's certain, I'm not asking you to say how much you make, but I'm saying that it, I'm glad that this question came up to a certain extent because I'm glad that this young person is thinking of, hey, I should be looking at the salary, not necessarily you shouldn't look at it on that hourly rate. You should look at it as an yeah. annual salary because now you're going to be a salary person. And there's various websites that you can actually go like Glassdoor or some other websites, Indeed.com, where you can actually get some of that data and it'll give you a range, a high level yeah. and a mid level and a low level. And you can kind of base that off for who you are and the type of career you want. So, so thank you for that type of question. Thank you, Eddie, sure. for answering that as well. Um, uh, we're gonna go with Pam Pamela. Pamela, I, I don't know. Can you um, can you unmute yourself and uh, ask your well, question? Nice to meet you, Edward Gonzalez. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm an electrical engineering student um, at SDSU, and um, I have a question for you regarding like pushing yourself um, and advocating for yourself constantly to get new opportunities. I find myself that I. I try to push myself and advocate for myself and I end up getting opportunities but often I feel like I'm not sure if I'm ready for those opportunities since I don't have anyone in my community uh, to give me advice because um, they haven't gone through those specific experiences and throughout the process I've taken those chances and I've been successful but the fear of failure um, that come with those opportunities is really big in my life and I just wanted to know, like, I know you've been in those situations because of all the chances you have taken. Yeah. What have you done um, to kind of continue to push yourself forward and take those chances? One of the things that I've recognized throughout my life is that if I'm really nervous about something, that something great's about to happen. And it, it's, it's always that way. It really is. Um, but for me, I want to make sure that I'm ready. So let me ask you this question. Now I'll pose this question to everybody. If you could be anything, anything at all tomorrow morning, what would that look like? What would that feel like? What would that taste like? You know, engage all your senses for a minute and then ask yourself this, what did you do today to make tomorrow happen? And that's that thing that I'm talking about when I mentioned about baseball and how I practiced every day. So for me, when I do a presentation, whether it's to one person, 20 people, or several thousand people, you know, people ask me, do I get nervous uh, doing that? Um, and the answer is, uh, uh, of course, because I'm excited, but in the grand scheme of things, no, I'm not because I'm ready. I prepare. I practice um, and I do this over and over again till I'm sick of hearing my voice and I'm sick of hearing my thoughts and I'm ready. So I wanna make sure that I'm always ready at all times for anything. And if I fail at something, whether I make a mistake, I miscalculated, whatever the case may be, I'm gonna write it down in my journal and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with several solutions so that won't ever happen again. 
So again, you may lose a situation, but don't lose the lesson. Don't ever lose the lesson because you'll say, okay, I stepped in a pothole. I know not to go that way again. So embrace your failures and keep moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful explanation and very insightful response to that question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we have one more question and this one's gonna go to Sofia Pantoja. Sofia, can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, thank you. Um, so I had a quick question. I wanted to uh, ask that you mentioned earlier how you should always try and keep like contacts with people so they don't forget who you are. And I was just wondering um, how you might go about in doing that. Like if it's more scheduling um, those 15 minute talks later on about new new questions of what they're working on or is it more like email updates on what you're working on i was just curious on any advice um, on keeping those networks going and i just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today oh me you're very welcome it was my pleasure um first of all uh mr herrera he's amazing you are so fortunate to have him he's fighting for you uh he sought me out and he brought me to you um, I wish I had somebody like that in my corner as I was coming up and I may not have, uh, might not have taken me, you know, 17 years to get to NASA. I might've gotten there a lot sooner. Um, so now to your point, um, let me see the best way to answer that. Do me a favor. Um, ask me the question again, um, from the beginning. Of course. Um, so I was just wondering, I know you mentioned like earlier on in the presentation about always trying to keep those contacts going and, ah. you know, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, and the reason I asked you to ask it again is because I wanted to be very clear and concise with my answer. So every day I spend 15 minutes and I and it's on my calendar. It just says networking. Okay. So what I do is I have a list of people that I reach out to every day. So it might be professional, it might be somebody at another NASA center, or it might be professional like Christopher Gardner, my mentor, okay? So what I'll do is I know that Chris is a big baseball fan. Now I'm a Dodger fan, he's a White Sox fan. So I'll check the box score to see if the White Sox lost and I'll just send him a quick email or a text and say, hey, how did your team do, LOL, okay? That's all it takes. And that's all I need to do to keep my network flowing with him. For somebody else, it might be, um, I know that this person likes Game of Thrones, okay? And Game of Thrones is, you know, obviously it's not in season right now, but let's just say that it was, I could say, you know, did you see the Game of Thrones last night? Oh my goodness, it was this and that. I was surprised by that. And that's all it takes. But as I said in the beginning, you want to find out where that person is most active. So for me, if you send me a direct message in my social media, you're going to get a response much faster. Um, if it's something that can wait, send me an email. But once I know, I'm always going to reach out to that person in that way. So I have friends that I only DM. I never text them. I have other people that if I text them, they respond right away. That's the method that I use to reach that particular person. But again, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of juggling to do this. But once you start doing it, it becomes habit and you start networking and, you know, you might be in line at Starbucks or something. Oh, I haven't talked to that person in a while. Send them a quick text. I was thinking about you. No response needed. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. That's that's very incredible. And I know we could definitely keep going and going and going with questions, but for uh, to be respectful of your time, are, are you okay with one more question or do you want to just kind of- Sure, tell you what, yeah, let's go five more minutes. Okay, let's go five more minutes with uh, Eddie and then uh, we'll kind of wrap it up with him and take a group picture. So the next person that I have here with their hand raised is Judith. Judith Seto, please, uh, if you don't mind taking your microphone on, and there we go. Hi, Eddie. Um, Hi. Thank you just for taking the extra time. Um, oh, you're I, welcome. 
Um, you mentioned a few things that kind of like stuck out to me. One of them was journaling and the other one was like your, your calendar. It seems like I'm really curious about other specific things that you've kind of put into your life that help you form these habits and make you successful because you also mentioned your wife. So you seem very busy. So I just really want to know like what kind of tools you use to keep like track of everybody. Um, again, it, it depends. So like with my wife, you know, we text each other constantly. Let me, you know, since you brought up my wife, now you're going to have to hear the story. Um, she's a professional artist. Um, she's also the CEO, founder, and president of a tech company that does work with NASA, Apple, Facebook, um, Department of Defense, NOAA. She's very successful and she's amazing. And I love that when I wake up in the morning, we have these amazing conversations at breakfast and I can't help but raise my game because of her game. You know, I call her my CEO, you know, she's just incredible. Um, so, oh my goodness. I said, I could do a whole presentation on just, on just her, but we have really good habits of, you know, we can bounce ideas off each other um, you know, I use, um, doodle, uh, if I'm going to request a meeting of a large group of people, um, I'll use, you know, zoom for some things, Microsoft teams for another, you know, it just depends on who I'm reaching out to and what is the best method of that. So it just depends. Um, but I do use a lot of different things, zoom, Microsoft teams, doodle to arrange meetings. I can also give them that link and say, if somebody wants to get on my calendar, you can go to that and find some time. I do journal every day. Uh, and sometimes it might be a sentence and sometimes it might be a full page. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to read. So I make sure and I take time to do that. I don't look at my time from a 24 hour perspective. I look at it from a full week perspective. And if I can do that, I seem to be able to fit more things in. And the one thing that I do sacrifice, which I don't encourage anybody to do, it's usually sleep. You know, if I can get five to six hours, I'm good. And when I get up, the first thing I do is I drink water because obviously I'm dehydrated. And then um, I'll have a cup of coffee and I will then, what am I, what is it that I'm doing today? And what do I need to accomplish? Is there something that I didn't finish yesterday that I need to do today? And then I'll reach for my phone because if I reach for my phone first, I could get caught up with that. The other thing too, is this, do you use an alarm clock? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So if you set your alarm for 6 AM, okay. And you wake up at say 5:30, get up, make your bed and start your day. You just gave yourself an extra half hour that's your body saying it's time to wake up, right? So the flip to that is your alarm goes off at six and at 5.30 when you said, oh, I've got another half hour, you're gonna fall into the deepest sleep that you ever had the best sleep of the whole night will happen during that half hour. So at 6 a.m., what are you gonna do? You're gonna hit snooze probably and maybe twice. So now instead of having a nice breakfast, you know, journaling what you're going to do for the day, you're now running out of the house late and that's going to be your day. You know, what, how you start off your day, that's how your day is going to be. So again, because my wife and I are on the same page, we'll often get up at 4.30 sometimes and we'll have breakfast. We'll talk about our day. Maybe we'll journal separately. And sometimes because it's so early, we're able to go back to sleep and take a quick power nap. But other times we'll just get up and get started and then maybe go to sleep early that night or not. But we're always looking for shortcuts and time because time is so important. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for that wonderful response.